Happy Thursday to everybody. Uh, we're going to be doing another Museums from Your Home live stream this morning. We're going to be live on the Alabama Museum of Natural History's Facebook page. Uh, so if you uh, enjoy watching it on Facebook, you can do that. It looks like we're live and good to go there. Uh, we're also going to be live on the UA Museum's YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash UA Museum. So if you do prefer, I know some people prefer YouTube uh, to Facebook. So just whatever your preference is, we'll be able to see your comments and uh, see you watching from both places. So uh, feel free to pick your preference if you have one. So I think uh, we're good to go. And uh, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started talking about today's topic. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the Communication Specialist for UA Museums. And today I'm joined, joined by Dr. John Friel, the Director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History to talk about amphibians this morning. So uh, uh, thanks for joining me, John, here. It looks like uh, you might be at uh, Smith Hall. Yeah, I'm going to do this one from my office at Smith Hall. I got a little bit more uh, speed in the internet, so hopefully the resolution will be better of the pictures as well as the audio. Well, I'm glad uh, somebody's uh, checking in on the Alabama Museum of Natural yeah, History. Yeah, I checked on everything. Everything is sound and secure here in Smith Hall. Good, good, to, good to know. All right. Well, uh, before we get started, I just want to remind anybody who is watching that we're broadcasting here on Facebook and YouTube. So all of this is live. So uh, uh, there's a good uh, benefit to that because you can actually ask us questions while we're going and you can leave us any comments if you if you have any in the comment section. So feel free to join in on the conversation and ask questions if you have them. And uh, this is live. So uh, like John mentioned uh, that we you know, hopefully won't have any connectivity issues, but uh, just be patient with us in case we do have any. And uh, so it, this is live, so anything can happen. Uh, but now that we've gotten some of that business out of the way, John, how should we get uh, started talking today? Sure, so this is kind of a follow-up. Uh, some of you that have been following our UA Museum's live streams, uh, this is the third one I've done. Um, last one I did was on lizards and snakes of Alabama. So today is gonna be kind of a continuation of that, but we're gonna focus on the amphibians, uh, in particular, the frogs and salamanders of Alabama. Um, so today I just wanna give you kind of a brief overview of some of the diversity, a little bit about the interesting biology behind these creatures. Uh, hopefully there will, some of these are species you may have seen before or recognized. And hopefully I'll tell you about some amazing amphibians that you may not have known uh, live in the state with us. So Rebecca, can you go ahead and, and share my screen and I'll start my presentation. Um, so what we see here, uh, look, uh, the first slide is just um, pulling off of iNaturalist, which is a platform I've also talked about on our live streams where we can share nature observations. These are the most common amphibians that have been reported from Alabama. So it's a mixture of both frogs and salamanders, uh, including toads, which are a type of frog. Um, and the idea is I want to basically give you kind of a brief overview. I can't uh, tell you a lot of detail about all the species. There's just too many within the uh, hour or so we'll have together. But I want to just give you an introduction to some of the, why I think they're really fascinating creatures um, and just some of the amazing diversity we can find here in the state. Um, this is a slide I used last time when I talked about lizards and snakes. Don't focus so much on the numbers. The numbers actually have changed a little bit, but what I want you to get an appreciation for is the diversity. Uh, Alabama ranks third in the country overall in reptile and amphibian diversity. We have somewhere probably now about 75, maybe possibly more species of amphibians. Uh, there are likely undescribed species of salamanders in Alabama, for instance. For instance. But just to give you an idea of the diversity. And um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about those today. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. There'll be a couple of pauses after different uh, segments of this talk. And Rebecca will probably uh, be looking at the comments and passing on any questions to me. So without further ado, let's start with some of the resources. I always like to point out, um, I'm doing this in my office. Uh, most of you are probably at your homes. Uh, we're still kind of, in many cases, not back to normal. But uh, because we can't go basically out and, uh, to interact with other people, I like to really stress uh, online resources. So I'm going to point out three online resources, which I think are really useful for identifying and learning about amphibians. The first one I have up here is an Amphibians of Alabama guide I put together on iNaturalist. So if you go to iNaturalist and look under guides and search for amphibians of Alabama, the URL appears on the screen. There's a little guide there where you can click on images and they'll pull up little pages with information about particular frogs and salamanders we have here. So it's a great resource. You can actually download this to your smart device if you've got uh, iNaturalist on your uh, phone. Another project on iNaturalist I like to plug, uh, iNaturalist is a big uh, favorite topic of mine. 
um, is a project to share your observation. So if you go out and observe a salamander or a frog or some other uh, amphibian or reptile, you can post it to iNaturalist and there's a group there specifically that will help identify it uh, called Herps of Alabama. Herps is just a kind of a colloquial term for amphibians and reptiles. Uh, it refers to herpetology, which is the scientific study of amphibians and reptiles. And then another resource I'd like to plug because it's very active um, on Facebook is the Alabama Reptile and Amphibian ID and Education Group. And uh, it tends to be a lot of focus on snakes, but they do cover amphibians as well. Uh, includes people all over the state and beyond that have some interest in amphibians. And it's a great place to learn about. Um, if you have questions, you can post them to this group and they're knowledgeable members of the group that will want to help you identify what you found as well as give you some basic information. If you observe something interesting that um, an amphibian reptile is doing, this is the place to post those observations or comments because people will respond to them. So those are just three resources uh, I like to point out um, that may be useful in the future when you're trying to identify or learn more about amphibians uh, in Alabama. So today we're going to talk about amphibians, uh, as some of you might know, uh, are quite diverse. Uh, we have two orders that are found in Alabama. We don't have any Sicilians, so that's the third order, which uh, occurs in, in tropical places elsewhere in the world, but not here in Alabama. But we do have frogs and toads, which are in the order Anura. And Anura refers to them ha not having a tail. So some features you can identify. Most people could identify a frog easily, but I'll just go over them. Um, Things that make frogs frogs, um, they typically lack tails as adults, uh, referring to the name Anora, unlike salamanders, although as tadpoles, they clearly do have tails. Um, they're also very specialized for jumping. Frogs have highly modified bodies that allow them to leap great distances, having typically enlarged hind limbs, uh, and most of them hop, some better than others. Uh, toads in particular are great hoppers and, and kind of crawl more than they hop, but they do have specialized bodies for that, and they're kind of unmistakable, uh, their body form. But nevertheless, they are quite diverse in how they can appear. And what I'm going to go through now are a little bit about, just to, by family, go through the diversity of uh, amphibians we have here in Alabama. The first one I'll talk about are toads, and most people recognize toads. These uh, true toads are the, are the family Bufonidae. Uh, these are typically uh, frogs in, in the broader sense that are much more resistant to desiccation or drying out. They tend to be not as slimy looking because their skins are more keratinized, kind of dry looking. Um, includes at least five species in Alabama. Here's a very typical looking toad, the American toad. Um, again, Typical toads, they're often quite warty looking. Uh, you can Don't worry, you cannot get warts from touching a toad. Um, this is a common misconception. One thing that they all share, uh, you might notice on the back of its neck are these two large bumps. Those are actually specialized glands that excrete a toxin. Uh, these are um, uh, parotid or paratoid glands, excuse me, that if you squeeze them, actually exude an alkaloid, which is a toxin to predators. Um, so all, all toads have those. A lot of amphibians actually have toxins associated with their skins, but in toads, the glands are particularly well-developed. Here's another one, um, a southern toad. Um, it looks a little bit different. I'll point out these ones, uh, a distinguishing feature are the crests on the top of its head. Between its eyes, you'll see there's two bony ridges. Those are actually part of the skull that protrudes up, and the pattern of those ridges differs between several toad species and is useful for identifying. But again, they have those large glands on the back of the neck as well. And one thing I want to point out about frogs, uh, this reminds me, uh, is that they're very acoustically active. That is, they produce sound. So all males of frogs typically have a courtship call. So unlike a lot of the salamanders, which are relatively silent, frogs, uh, particularly during the breeding season, uh, you'll often hear them before you'll see them. And I'm going to play some uh, sounds along the way just so you get a sense for what some of these animals sound like. In general, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> toads have... Um, kind of a, a trill-like sound, which you'll hear here. Here's the, here's the call for the southern toad. Uh, anyone that lives near a body of water in the summer, or in the spring sometimes here as well, will hear these calling, very distinctive kind of trill-like sound. Uh, a common toad we get here, this is actually a fowler's toad from my own uh, front yard. Um, very similar looking, uh, the crest and the, and the head are not as big. Uh, one of the distinguished features of Fowler's to toads, excuse me, is how many warts they have uh, within each of the dark spots. So Fowler's toads tend to have three or more uh, warty projections 
on their backs and inside these darker spots. Um, in southern Alabama, we have a really tiny toad called the oak toad. These are something that you get on the coastal plain. These are really small. That's in someone's hand, and that's an adult. So they don't get much bigger than maybe an inch and a half, two inches maximum. A uh, really small toad. They sound a little bit different. You might imagine a smaller toad might sound different. These ones sound like this. Almost, that almost reminds me of like a bird chirping. Uh, much different than the uh, sound you heard before for the uh, southern toad. And then the last toad species I'll talk about, this was actually um, the Gulf Coast toad. It's in a different genus, uh, a type of toad that is more common kind of in Central America, getting into um, Southern North America, all the way to Louisiana. And until a few years ago, was not reported from Alabama. And then in the past couple of years, uh, there have been spottings of it around the Montgomery area. And there's a lot of kind of, it's, it's really unclear if this was all along an isolated population of this species that wasn't discovered previously, or perhaps a relocation that's now become established. Uh, so we don't know, it's kind of a real mystery, but um, points to the fact that, and I mentioned the, the species numbers is always changing for the states. We occasionally do get records uh, for new species that are being introduced to the state. Um, one thing I wanna put in uh, talking about toads is that uh, toads often get uh, picked on for being ugly, um, being warty looking. Uh, a lot of people make fun of them and kind of think they're kind of the ugliest looking frogs. I tend to disagree. I think frogs are actually, uh, excuse me, toads in particular are quite good looking. And I thought I'd throw in a, a little levity here. Um, I was reminded when I was preparing my talk that there actually is a gentleman in Alabama who actually has a site and he creates hats for toads. He noticed that toads, um, they're quite personable. They often will come to lights at night. If you leave your front or porch light on or back uh, porch light on, you may notice um, it attracts insects and the toads figure out that their insects are there. And uh, this gentleman realized that and came up with a cute idea of creating little tiny hats for his uh, toad friends. So I'll put a plug out for the toad guy, or the toad hat guy on Twitter. Um, you can follow him and he, he's still active producing little hats for his toad friends. Are there any questions about toads before we move on? Uh, let me see. It doesn't look like we have any questions at this time, uh, but I love I love the toad guy. I'm I'm obsessed with the uh, the hats on the toads. They look great. Uh, so fashionable. <laughs> yeah, they really are. They they have a lot of personality. And I my own experience. I've had one. Uh, I sometimes blacklight for insects at night, and uh, my local toads have learned, and they will hop up my steps to my front porch uh, to eat the stray insects that get drawn in. And, you know, they're basically harmless. They, they generally uh, get quite accustomed to humans. So unlike a lot of frogs, which will hop away, frog, sometimes toads will hop right in front of you without any worries. Uh, like I said, they, <laughs> because of their toxins, there are a lot of things that eat toads. There are a few things that do. Um, there are some snakes that can eat them. But in general, um, they're pretty impervious uh, to predators. So the next group of uh, frogs we'll talk about are very different looking frogs. These are tree frogs in the family Hylidae. Uh, these are quite diverse. We have over 15 species here in Alabama, and I'll go through some examples here. Uh, uh, as the name implies, they tend to be much more uh, climbing, unlike the, the toads, which you, you only ever find on the ground. Um, the tree frogs can be quite, you'll find them up in trees, some in bushes. Uh, they tend to be much better climbers and have body forms that kind of resemble that. They have big, thickened toe pads that help them adhere to things. Some can actually stick to glass and smooth surfaces. Um, here's a common one. Uh, we get here the acris, which are the cricket frogs. We have both a southern and a northern species. Um, they're quite variable in their color, coloration pattern. They often have a triangular shaped uh, patch between their eyes. Uh, striping on their legs, and uh, they're not very big, so that's me holding one in my hand, and that's an adult. And they have pretty distinctive calls. Um, it's been described as sounding like glass marbles rubbing together, so I'll, I'll play the sound of those right now so you can kind of visualize and hear what that sounds like. Almost if you were rubbing like some mar glass marbles together, that kind of squeaking sound. Um, and again, their name, it sounds a little bit like crickets. That's, that's why they're called cricket frogs. Um, next one is a really common, this is one of the most common tree frogs uh, I see around my house, um, Cope's gray tree frog, highly chrysolarius. Um, you can see a little bit better on this image, um, the, the expanded toe pads. And then this is a male. So I mentioned uh, all male frogs and toads call. Um, 
they, if you've ever seen them actually call, they do it in a couple of ways. They actually use their larynx or their voice box to produce it, but they actually have an expandable throat patch. Sometimes it's single pouch, sometimes it's paired, depending on the species, that kind of amplifies that sound. So they're drawing air into the lungs and push it out and then use this uh, vocal sac as kind of resonator, uh, almost like a bagpipe. It really amplifies the sound, and that's how they produce these courtship sounds. And the female frogs actually can pick up on really subtle details, and they actually use it to assess the quality of their mates, uh, much like bird song. So it's kind of analogous where uh, female birds choose the male that has the best sound or a sound that they think indicates that that male frog is a healthy individual that would make a good mate. Um, same thing's happening in frogs. So here's an example of what the Cope's great uh, tree frog sounds like. Kind of a trill sound, a little bit like the toads. Uh, I've sometimes actually heard these in the middle of the day. I've been walking in my neighborhood, and while uh, they're most common at night, you will sometimes get them during the day uh, near bodies of water, even sometimes small bodies of water, temporary ponds that people may have in their backyards. Oops. Um, another one, this is a really popular one that we see a lot of, the green tree frog, Hylocinarius. These are quite distinctive. They're usually this bright green uh, with a distinctive white stripe along their side that sometimes continues all the way up to their uh, upper lip. Uh, they sometimes have gold spots, though, so you will see some individuals that have, this one has one or two small gold spots. Some individuals have no gold spots. Others will have uh, dozens of them, so it's a little bit variable. But again, it's a pretty dis distinctive, iconic uh, tree frog we'll see here. And again, you can see on its front foot there, those expanded toe pads on its right uh, front limb. This is what they sound like. And there's several individuals here. A little more of a, kind of a, almost a honking sound. And in some of these recordings, sometimes um, you'll hear multiple frogs, and, and it's, it's quite common where you'll hear not only multiple individuals of one species calling, trying to attack, track mates, but sometimes multiple species. And sometimes it's kind of a neat quiz you can go out. And there actually are projects. Um, there's a project, Frog Watch USA, which um, unfortunately this year there was going to be training at Ruffner Mountain for it for the Birmingham, Alabama area, but it got canceled because of the uh, COVID pandemic. But hopefully next year it'll resume where you can go out and help document um, amphibian populations by listening to them. So it's something I would encourage people that have any interest in documenting nature, not only through uh, photography, but also going out and listening. Uh, John, uh, just uh, want to pop in here for a second. Um, are, are, are you uh, trying to get to individual slides of the individual amphibians? Yeah, they're not uh, like the up here. Let me refresh it. Sorry yeah. about that. I'm yeah, no, that, that's all right. Let me close my image and refresh it. This is one of the technical things we come up with. Uh, it, it's live. It happens. Me, it happens. Me, uh, yeah, I can pull up some uh, green tree frogs as well. I'll just share my screen again. And usually it's, there seems to be a refresh okay. issue. Uh, yeah, sometimes if uh, okay. get it going. Yep. One second. Sorry the, about that. The, the sounds were awesome, though. It sounded great. Well, that's actually probably a better quiz now, so you have no idea what the frog looks like. So. <laughs> Yeah, that would be much harder to uh, identify, but it's, that, uh, no, it's good training. I think it's refresh. So yeah, there we go. There we go. Let me back up if you didn't see this. So um, let me switch here. I'll go back to just quickly go through the image. So that was the southern cricket frog. Cope's gray tree frog. Yep, that's a little bit of the sound there. The green tree frog. <laughs> And then we have a barking tree frog. And again, uh, this is uh, one that is kind of distinctive. It tends to have kind of really bumpy, warty skin. Uh, it depends on the individual. And it often has like darker spots. And uh, it gets its name because it has a, a sound that some people think resembles that of a barking dog. So let's see if you think it, it sounds like that. I'm not sure it sounds like my dogs, but... Compared to the other, I, I can I can hear it though. I can hear yeah. some of the some of the dog in there. And these are refreshing properly now, Rebecca, because uh, I've got a full screen of yeah. my end, so I'm not seeing what it looks like on the uh, live feed. Yeah, no, it looks good now. And I guess while we're stopped, I guess we could take um, some questions to because uh, we do have some. Uh, Carl asks, uh, "What is the home of a toad like? Do you know where toads make their homes?" Yeah, so toads um, they typically hide under objects. I mean, they're not. They're kind of big and chunky, so they can't get under really flat objects, but they often hide under uh, rocks. A lot of people 
um, actually you can put homes in your garden. They, you know, they almost like little anything that a little hole um, or kind of maybe a log or something where they can find a little crevice. They'll hide in cracks and patios. Um, and like I said, you can actually buy commercially made toad houses and you know, people put them in their garden. It almost looks like a flower pot with a little mouse hole in it. And uh, toads will use those for home. They can also bury. So depending on the season, when it gets really dry, particularly in the winter, sometimes they will actually bury in the ground, um, sometimes in leaf litter. Um, but in general, they, they tend to be a little more at the surface um, under objects that kind of have little spaces on them where they can get in and hide during the day. Yeah, I saw an American toad in my neighborhood who was sort of hiding in this little area of the grass, um, just kind of hanging out, I guess. Yeah, but, once you uh, find out where they hide, they're kind of, they kind of space out. Um, they will sometimes call from those hides. And then obviously when they breed, and one thing I should point out about amphibians is, um, unlike reptiles, they all have to return to water to breed in most cases. I'll give you one exception in a moment. But So in general, toads, when it's breeding time, they'll move to bodies of water, and that's when you hear them calling. But after they're breeding, the adults return, they disperse, and can show up far from water. So that's the other thing, too. You don't always have to be right next to bodies of water to find some of these amphibians. And I guess while we're talking about barking tree frogs uh, sounding like dogs, I guess uh, dogs may sometimes eat toads. Uh, have you ever heard yeah, of something like, like that? Like I mentioned, uh, they do cats as well. There are other, other animals. As I said, um, our toads we have here do have toxins. They, they may make the dog sick. They're unlikely to kill the dog. Um, there are some toad species that gets much larger. Um, there are like marine, giant marine toads, which are introduced in Florida. They're not in Alabama yet, but they could be with climate change in the future. They get big enough and can produce enough toxin um, that pets could be threatened by them. A dog could definitely get sick. Um, a small dog possibly could die if it got enough, enough of the toxins. Um, the other weird thing, just because I like weird facts about frogs, is some of these toxins are reported to be hallucinogenic, and there are people that actually, believe it or not, lick toads uh, to have a hallucinogenic experience. So um, it's, it, it is a thing. So toads, a lot of interesting biology, but you know, most of the chemicals they're producing are for their own defense. But um, in, in general, probably you don't need to worry about them. You know, again, I tell people, actually, if you ever handle frogs, uh, be careful to wash your hands. Because sometimes I've heard of cases of people that have been handling frogs, let them go, and then rub their eyes and have gotten irritation due to some of the wow. toxins. That's, that's something to be aware of. If you and your cat there, in general, you're not going to get sick from them. They're not going to hurt you. But again, it's, it's, it's something to be aware of. Um, besides that, a lot of frogs and toads, as do many reptiles, also can carry salmonella. It's another good reason to wash your hands after you've been handling any kind of amphibian or reptile before you deal with food. Yeah, that sounds like a good practice. I guess we'll take one more question before sure. we get back into the presentation. Uh, do toads hop? They do. Now, like I said, frogs are the good hopper. So uh, we have some giant frogs. There are frog hopping races. Toads typically are not uh, allowed to enter because they're relatively poor hoppers. Um, a lot of a lot of like things like bullfrogs. I'll talk about in a bit. Those are really good leapers. Some of the tree frogs can leap, you know, a dozen times their body length. I mean, there there are actually frogs that can leap almost 30 feet. There's a, there's a giant frogs in Africa are called rocket frogs that can leap incredible distances. Um, toads are kind of on the other end of the spectrum. They're kind of, they hop at their own pace, not moving very quickly <laughs> and not very, their stride is not very big. But again, they rely a lot more on their defenses, uh, yeah. particular toxins to get by. So, And then there's some frogs that actually walk. Some of the tree frogs, if you watch them, literally almost walk and climb along branches. So they, there are a couple different modes of locomotion that uh, frogs can use. And then obviously swimming. Um, if you watch frogs swim, they have a very distinctive way of kicking with their hind legs, often putting their front legs back along their sides and then kicking uh, with their hind legs while they swim at the surface. Yeah, 30 feet. That's quite a distance. Yeah, people <laughs> rocket frogs sometimes. They're big wow. and they can jump really long, far distances. I'm I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Well, um, I guess uh, we'll, we'll, we've uh, gone through the questions. So I guess if you want to hop back in your presentation, we'll keep going. Did, did that refresh, Rebecca? Am I in a squirrel tree frog it now? Did, it did. It, okay, it looks great, great now. Um, so again, this is something that also gets confused uh, sometimes with the green tree frog, the squirrel tree frog, uh, Hyla squirrella. Uh, these ones are all over the state. Um, they tend to be really common at like uh, bathrooms at campsites for some reason. They like that environment. Um, so that's the most common frog you'll get there. Uh, they come in all different shades, green, brown, uh, tan. And uh, here's what they sound like. I guess they sound a little bit like 
the, I don't know if you've ever heard like uh, the call of a, of a uh, squirrel, like a alarm call. So it sounds a little bit like that, and I'm sure that's where the common name comes from. Spring peepers. This is one that probably a lot of people recognize. It's usually one of the first frogs you'll hear in the spring. Um, this is actually, in fact, a type of tree frog in the genus Sudacris. Uh, their name Crucifer refers to cross. Um, they typically have this X-shaped cross on their back. So that's a really good way to find them. These are relatively small frogs, much like the cricket frogs. And uh, this is a sound almost everyone's heard. Uh, if you've ever heard a frog, it's probably been this sometime in spring. They can almost be deafening uh, in, the, in the large numbers when, they're, when the males are breeding. It's a really common uh, spring, summer type sound of these spring peepers peeping away. So that's it for the tree frogs. There are a lot more species, but we've got to move on to some other families so we can cover all the diversity. Um, one non-native uh, frog we get is a neotropical frog, a leptodactylid frog called the greenhouse frog. And this is a species that's native to Cuba, some other uh, islands in the West Indies, was introduced into Florida and now has been expanding into Alabama. So it's not all throughout the state yet, but it's definitely in the southern part of the state. And again, like with warming of climates, um, a lot of these species will continue to expand northward. This is probably one of them. And it's claim to fame. Uh, the, there's a picture on the right. of the, It's a small frog, um, not very big. Their name, they, they're, they're, they're often in greenhouses, probably came in in ornamental plants. Um, not very big, just not very distinctive looking a tree frog. But what makes it kind of unique, at least among the frogs you might have in Alabama, is it doesn't have a distinctive tadpole stage. It actually lays its eggs above ground. So what you see on the right is actually a cluster of green frog, greenhouse frog eggs. And inside them are actually their tadpoles. Their tadpoles develop in the eggs outside of water and moist soil. And then they hatch out as little miniature frogs. Um, so this is the only frog species in Alabama that does that. All our other frog and toad species have to return to bodies of water, have to lay their eggs in water, and have to go through a tadpole stage that lives in water before they metamorphose and become a terrestrial living adult. So a little kind of fact there that uh, hopefully some of you might not have appreciated, but uh, I think it's a really interesting uh, adaptation. So that's it for the one. Let's move on to microhylid frogs. Again, we only got a single species here, but this is uh, this is actually another. They're called they're they're frogs, but they're called toads. Um, and again, uh, they're true toads. Toads are generally things that tend to be a little more. Um, terrestrial looking or toad looking or looking like true toads, which I think maybe the narrow mouth toad does. Uh, we've got one species here, uh, Gastrophony carolinensis. It's kind of an odd looking uh, toad. It has a really narrow head and mouth, hence the name uh, narrow mouth toad. Here's an individual actually I photographed down in Moundville. Uh, it was under a trash lid, a, a trash can lid that I picked up. Um, kind of really narrow body. You often sometimes have a very distinctive, right behind the eye, there's like a, a skin fold, which a lot of the individuals show, but the body form is, is pretty typical. And they're not very common. They tend to be underground and under leaf litter much more than things like that. But what I love about them is I think they have one of the uh, kind of most unique um, songs of any frogs we have in Alabama. And uh, it's been described to me. A lot of people, when they hear it, are kind of horrified. They don't realize it's a frog. It sounds a lot like a, the bleat of a sheep. So I'll play this sound here. And some of you may recognize it, and, and you may have not known that it was a frog, but it's kind of a little off-putting. It sounds like almost sounds like a scream. But here's the call, what I think is a really amazing call for the Easton Narrowmouth Toad. I'll let you decide what you think. So some people think it sounds like a scream. I think it sounds a lot like a, a sheep or a, or a, a lamb call. But uh, what what do people think? I'm kind of curious. Uh, but I think it's very distinctive. You will, will not mistake this for any other frog species in Alabama. Yeah, I think you're probably closer to the uh, the sheep there uh, with, with that one. Uh, that's what it sounded like to me. Okay, another uh, family we have here that, again, is not well represented, but we do have a very distinctive species, are the spadefoot toads. And these look a little bit more like the true toads, uh, the family Pelobatidae, one species, the eastern spadefoot toads, Scaphiophis holbrookii. Here's a picture of them. They do look very toad-like, so I think a lot of people, um, when they first see one, would think it's a true toad. Um, these ones are not as terrestrial. They tend to be buried under the ground. You typically only see them during the breeding season in the spring. Uh, when they kind of emerge out of the ground. Uh, species out west tend to be completely underground until the rainy seasons. 
And uh, sometimes they have little red dots on them, very kind of warty skin. So very similar, but they aren't a different family, uh, the spadefoot toads. And this is what they sound like. Ah. It sounds like a squeak. Maybe stepping on a dog toy ah. or something. Croak. Ah. So the idea is, that, you know, there's not going to be a quiz on this, but I really want you to appreciate not only do these frogs look different, they sound very different. And either you can learn them visually to identify them, but also add the challenge of just going out to your favorite pond at night and trying to figure out what species might be there. And then we move on to the true frogs. So these are things that a lot of people think of when you think of a bullfrog, a green frog. Um, these, a lot of people, this is the image that comes to mind when you think of frogs. Uh, we have eight species here in Alabama. Um, we'll just go through some of these. Um, Pointed a few differences. Probably the most common known one is the bullfrog. Um, and again, these are our largest true frog. Um, just reminded, um, credit, uh, there's a very talented photographer who's a professor at the University of North Alabama, uh, Matt Nima Miller. Uh, he takes a lot of awesome pictures of amphibians. Uh, so a lot of these photos you'll see are his. This is one that he's got his credit on here. So I want to make sure I give a plug to him. Um, beautiful photography, and he submits all these to iNaturalist. So if you want to see more of his photography, uh, go to the Herbs of Alabama group. You'll see more of his amazing uh, amphibian photos. But bullfrogs, as their name suggests, they get big. They have the name. Um, they also have distinctive sounds. And also, this picture reminds you really well to talk about hearing in frogs. I mentioned the, the males produce calls. They also have very good hearing. Well, they don't have uh, external ears. They do have an eardrum. So the circle you see behind the eye, that's called the tympanum. That's like the uh, eardrum of the frog. And what's kind of neat in bullfrogs and some other frog species, and you can actually tell the sex of a frog by the size of that. So male bullfrogs, that tympanum, that eardrum is bigger than the eye. Whereas in females, it's the same size or smaller. So th this picture, I would say that looks like uh, an, a female uh, bullfrog based on the size of a tympanum. little trivia you can impress your friends with or maybe win something at a trivia night. And this is what the bullfrogs sound like. They've got a very distinctive call. Kind of almost like a bellows. Another very common frog here is the bronze frog, sometimes called the green frog. Uh, very common here. What distinguishes this, they don't get quite as big as bullfrogs, and they have a very distinctive fold that's going back from the eye to the hind limb called a dorsal lateral fold on both sides. And these are very well developed in bronze frogs, whereas in um, the bullfrog I just showed you, there isn't really a complete ridge. They're just kind of incomplete. There's some raised parts of it, but not a complete ridge. So, and the brown or green frog, which is a different subspecies, um, has that. And this is what they sound like. A little more like a little pluck rather than the deep bellows you heard for the bullfrog. Pickerel frog, one of my favorite uh, true frogs, pickerel frog with a base. These are not as common. Um, a lot of people mistake them for the southern leopard frog. And what distinguishes them having the dorsolateral fold as well as having these very symmetrical spots paired along the back. Um, these pickerel frogs um, are kind of specialists of hiding little cracks in your bodies of water. And this is one I've actually took a picture of at uh, Turkey Creek Nature Preserve a couple of years ago at a bio blitz. And here's what they sound like. They're kind of really creak, uh, uh, creaky sounding. Really different than the uh, green frog. Uh, and the bullfrog I showed you earlier. And then I think this is the last uh, true frog I'll talk about, the southern leopard frog. So we compared this to the pickerel frog. I mentioned how in the pickerel frog, the spots tend to be paired in, in quite regular shape, a little bit more rectangular. In the leopard frog, they tend to be more irregular. Sometimes there's one on one side, not on another. Much pointier snout. That's the other thing. If you saw this from above, you notice the snout is much pointier. And our southern leopard frogs sound like this. Got kind of a creaky sound. And then the last one I put on there, just another frog, is the wood frog. Just to show you that not all these frogs are green. The wood frog is a frog that tends to be brown in coloration. Um, this one, I would guess, is a female. This is a really chunky looking individual, and that probably means it's full of eggs, probably moving to uh, a, um, a pool where it will be looking for mates to breed and lay its eggs. And that's the last frog we'll talk about. Again, a beautiful picture by uh, my friend Matt Nymiller up in uh, Huntsville area. 
Uh, John, uh, would you like to take some questions? Sure. That's while we're just sort of so we'll yeah. all the fraud questions before we move on to salamanders. Uh, Belinda uh, asked about toxins with uh, toads and frogs. Are, are they enough to kill snakes? Is is that something I that ever happened? I don't know cases. A lot of snakes figure out that they're distasteful. There are things like our uh, hognose snakes, which actually do eat toads. Uh, they're able to deal with the toxins. Other animals generally will try to eat them and spit them out or regurgitate them. So I don't know many cases of, but you know, like most things, there probably been a case where um, I've heard of something swallowing a toad that's too big for it. So I, it's very rare. I think in most cases, the animals figure out that they can't eat them. There are other toxic salamanders that I'll talk about in a bit that are very similar. Uh, animals find out very quickly that um, they can't deal with them. Uh, they just are distasteful. So I wouldn't worry too much. I like I said, in general, most of our um, the only thing that would prey on one of our toads here would be a native um, hognose snake that could handle it. And uh, there's a question about uh, do tree frogs live their entire lives in trees? No, like I said, they all have to return to water to breed. And um, like I said, some of them don't even get in trees. Some of them, you know, I would call them shrub frogs, but they are off the ground. So the thing is, Almost all the tree frogs have the ability to climb. Things like cricket frogs, they don't climb more than a couple of inches off the ground. Um, where other things might climb up 12 feet up in a canopy or further. Um, a lot of them are kind of between three to six feet. It really depends on the species. A lot of them have preferred heights. Some like to call right at the edge of the water. Some like to find things like cattails to climb on. So it's kind of species specific, but um, you get them in a range, but typically at some distance off the ground. And there was also a question about uh, frogs, like frog legs as a human food source. Are there any it's raised frog, commercially uh, yep, for food? Yeah. Yep, they definitely do. So a lot of these things, like the toxins are all in the skin. So I guess if you wanted, um, you could eat any of these animals if you remove the skin. That's where most of the toxin is, and the muscle is fine. Um, that's true. And, and frogs' legs typically come from true frogs, big, ranted frogs, um, like bullfrogs and pig frogs. Um, those are actually in some places farmed commercially. Um, and there, there's enough muscle on them. Frogs are jumpers, so some of the biggest muscles are their leg muscles. Um, so they are harvested. Um, they don't include the skin. They remove the skin, and the muscle is perfectly fine to eat. All right. I think that's uh, going to do it for our questions right now. So uh, we can hop okay. into I uh, hop. I, that, <laughs> I did not mean that as a, as a pun uh, to hop into uh, salamanders. Well, so we'll f for the remainder of the time, I'm going to wrap up with talking about salamanders. So the other uh, group of amphibians we have here in Alabama, they're in a different order, order Eurodella. Um, these are distinctive in having tails. So I mentioned adult frogs don't have tails. Um, these ones are more um, designed for crawling or, or burrowing. Um, very distinctive animals. Again, you'll see some similarities. Um, they tend to be all require, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them do require um, water to breed in. Uh, again, there are some exceptions of some that will lay on land, but all require very moist environments. And they're particularly diverse. And, I, and there are probably a lot of undescribed cryptic species within the state. Um, salamanders, we're in, the eastern U.S. is uh, a hot spot for them. And although we don't have the most species in the nation, um, we're just behind Tennessee for having the largest number of salamander species in our state, and we have some remarkable ones. We'll start with one that just barely gets in the state, the hellbender. Um, this is a large, actually giant salamander um, that's completely aquatic. We have one species that just barely gets into the Flint River system in uh, northern Alabama. These are large aquatic salamanders. Um, uh, they all have great names or great nicknames. The hellbender, uh, uh, other names I've seen for this uh, that I think are kind of uh, funny. Snot otter is a name I've heard of, and uh, lasagna lizards. Um, and there's lots of other ones that reflect kind of their weird morphology. They get up to about two feet in length. They're related to giant salamanders that occur in China and Japan. They get up to almost six feet in length. Um, there's two individuals in this photo here. They have very tiny eyes, large mouths, a big fold of skin along their sides, no external gills. So I'll point that out a lot. Some of the salamanders will retain uh, external gills as adults. Um, Cryptobranchus is the name he refers to, hidden gills. Uh, they don't have external gills as adults. But these are kind of very imperiled salamanders. There's a lot of interest in conservation of these. Uh, even outside of Alabama, they don't seem to be re reproducing. They require very clean water. Um, they live under big flat rocks. So uh, it's, it's kind of a really special al uh, a salamander that um, many Alabamians don't realize we have in our state. And again, unlike frogs, uh, most salamanders don't produce any sounds, so there's not going to be any sounds in this part of my talk. 
Another group of salamanders, some people might be familiar with, are what we call mole salamanders, abyssostomatids. They're named mole salamander for the fact that they spend the vast majority of their lives underground. Um, and we typically only see them at the surface around the breeding season when they're moving to or moving from um, the kind of uh, pools of water that they breed in. And we've got six species in Alabama. And they tend to be kind of brightly colored. Um, here's a common species, spotted salamander. There's actually a, a, a festival that takes place every year in Birmingham. Um, celebrating the, the, the early in the spring when the salamanders are moving. And uh, in some places on a rainy night in the spring, um, you'll see these crossing the road, trying to get to the little temporary ponds that they, or pools that they breed in. Um, as this one reflects, our uh, name ref refers to it has spots. These spots can be yellow, sometimes orange. I've seen some that are almost red and, and, and are very distinctive. Um, a related species, the marble salamander, different marbling pattern. In this case has got lighter kind of grayish white uh, pattern that resembles marble. Um, this is another common species you'll see here throughout the state. And then tiger salamanders are another one. These get quite big, um, uh, different pattern. So again, these things are typical salamander looking animals. Uh, some of them get quite large, but most are probably in the order as adults of, you know, three to four inches. Some get maybe six to eight, depending on what species. So then we're going to move into some probably less common salamanders, um, but I think they're cool nonetheless. One really neat family are the amphiumas. Uh, we have three species. We actually have all three species. And what's cool about amphiumas is they're totally aquatic salamanders. Um, they only occur in the southeastern U.S., and we have all three species here in the state of Alabama. And they're kind of cool in that they're unusual looking, and you can recognize all the species because they differ in the number of toes they have. We have a one-toed species, a two-toed species, and a three-toed species of amphiuma. Um, and when you see them, they look really weird. So here's a picture. The body form is kind of the same in all of these. Um, they're large aquatic animals, um, often get to one to two feet in length. Um, here's a two-toed animal. So what I'll point out is no external gills. Um, they sometimes are called conger eels or congo eels. Um, they're not eels at all. Um, live in kind of swampy areas. They're nocturnal. A lot of people don't see them, but they occasionally you'll catch them in minnow traps. Um, they will occasionally move out of bodies of water on rainy nights to move between bodies of water. So you can occasionally um, encounter them in grassy areas and kind of weedy areas that are wet at night. Uh, that are connected or if they have something drying up, they're trying to move. But they do have forelimbs and high limbs. And you'll notice at the very front of this animal, there's a little tiny forelimb. And on the back, they're actually paired. You can just see the one on the right side, it's hind limb. So they have four limbs, uh, which will distinguish them from some of the other similar looking salamanders. And you can almost make out on the hind limb of this one, they're two toes. So this is a two-toed amphiuma. And the next photo is a picture of me uh, holding a three-toed one. If you look down at the little tiny forelimb, hopefully you can see there are three digits. Um, and again, no external gills. Um, these actually are air breathing. They do breathe air, uh, but they can feed underwater. And they're actually, they have a little gill slit that is for releasing water just above their arm there. So they swallow the water with their prey item and then push out the water through that gill slit, but they're not using internal gills to respire. They actually do have to come to the surface for air and they can actually drown. Sometimes if you get them caught in a minnow trap that is not uh, positioned so part of it's above water, they'll actually drown before um, people can release from their traps. So really cool a salamander. And like I said, we have all three known species in, in the world we have right here in Alabama. Another large group of salamanders are the plethodontid salamanders. These are lungless salamanders. So um, these are terrestrial salamanders, but they lack lungs and, and they do all their respiration through their skin. And we have at least 26 species in the state. I bet that number is going to go up. There are studies going on now for several groups, which are kind of probably full of uh, multiple species, some which may be morphologically indistinguishable from other species. But as we start studying the genetics, we're likely to find some really cool ones. And it includes some special salamanders that are only found only in Alabama. Um, some really special ones are the green salamander. This is a favorite of mine um, that occurs throughout the state. In Tuscaloosa, we're just at the southern limit of it, uh, but it's much more common in the north. These are uh, are kind of, I think of them almost like the tree frogs of salamanders. They climb. So you will find these things climbing on limestone cliffs. Um, they like to live in little cracks during the day and come out at night. And just amazing. These ones are, are, are real climbers. And you're sometimes surprised finding these things six, eight feet off the ground 
on a lime uh, limestone cliff wall here in Alabama because uh, they're not on typically on the ground on in a forest floor as you might expect for other salamanders I'll talk about. Um, sometimes uh, buffaloes are called woodland salamanders. That was what I was trying to, to get at with that a reference. Um, Desmognathus is another genus. Here's a very common species, the spotted dusky salamander. Desmognathus, if you see them, they typically have a white patch running from the corner of their eye to the jaw of the mouth. So that's something else I'll point out. Um, one neat thing about salamanders, um, because they're not using calls, um, they use chemical sensors a lot. So a lot of Pothodon salamanders actually have specialized glands on their chins for putting down scents. And they actually can communicate with other individuals, recognize members of the same species, recognize members of the opposite scent, uh, sex, excuse me, by using um, the scents that they produce. So uh, again, kind of a secret life is going on with these salamanders. They're communicating with each other um, using chemicals uh, that we're just not able to smell or perceive. So I really kind of, I like that idea knowing that there are animals out there communicating in ways that we just are in, in, in modes that we're just not able to uh, visualize. Cave salamander, uh, Eurycia, these tend to be very long-tailed salamanders. These ones sometimes get into caves, but you can find them sometimes out of caves. This is another one of uh, Matt Niemeyer's. He does a lot of work in caves, so this is one of his cave salamander photos. Um, beautiful animal. Same genus, but just showing you they vary. Again, a long-toed, the long-tailed salamander, appropriately named. Um, there's also some two-lined two and three-lined salamanders in this group. Again, more typically on, on the leaf, you might find something like this flipping over uh, a log or turning over a leaf litter in a forest. Spring salamanders, uh, these are big plethodontids that occur and typically associated with bodies of water, uh, typically not very far for them. So you won't get them out of the water, but usually they're right along wet areas, kind of often orange reddish in color. Uh, these get quite large. Some of these, I want to say six inches plus. Uh, one of the bigger salamanders you might encounter, encounter along a stream. Uh, the four-toed salamander, as his name implies, some of these names make sense. This guy only has four toes on his hind feet. Most of the salamanders I've mentioned have five. Uh, only one species in the genus. Um, and then here's a really special salamander. So I'm not looking at the live stream, but through this, there's probably been a little icon up in the upper right-hand corner of the Alabama Museum of Natural History's logo. And that logo is based upon the Red Hill Salamander. This is a salamander that has found no place else in the world except Alabama and is a really remarkable plethodontid species. It's one of the largest. It gets almost up to 10 inches in length and is only found in a little area between the Alabama and Conecuh Rivers in southern Alabama, the Red Hills of Alabama. Lives on very specific habitats, uh, these uh, very wet uh, cliff faces uh, that have these little tiny cracks in them. And these animals spend most of their lives living in holes. This is a, a picture of one. If you ever saw in the wild, it probably wouldn't be out of its hole like this. It would be in its hole like this. And uh, often you just see their heads poking out. A really cryptic species and uh, unfortunately imperiled. It's, it's one of our federally th uh, listed threatened species because its habitat is so threatened. Uh, many of the areas are used for logging. So it's one of these things that is incredibly special to Alabama, unique in the world. Um, and it's just a really bizarre animal, and, and it's kind of like, I like to think of it, I think of salamanders as being pandas of the amphibian world. This is really Alabama's panda, and uh, if you're interested, I've, and that was one reason why we chose it for our logo. It's something that is um, just our, I, I, iconic and is our a great representative, and I'm very proud to have in our logo uh, for our museum system. Other uh, species, uh, if you ever count them, slimy salamanders are really common. We have several species. They all kind of look alike. Um, they're all called slimy salamanders because they produce very sticky mucus. If you handled one of these, um, you'd realize this, that your hands would get covered in sticky mucus very quickly uh, and is reflected in their names. Um, sometimes they're black, often with white or golden spots. Southern zigzag salamander, same genus. Um, there are several very similar looking species um, in this genus. Here's one, a red salamander, Pseudotriton. This is a favorite of mine. This was actually one I, I saw in a really unusual, this was, I literally photographed this in my neighborhood. I was walking my dogs and my wife noticed this on the sidewalk. And it was very unusual habitat, but this I knew immediately what it was. It's one of our big chunky salamanders, the red salamander, Pseudotriton ruber. And it's kind of uh, one of my isolation observations that didn't make it uh, to our Facebook live streams, but uh, really distinctive red salamander, orange colored with black spots. So that's it for um, 
the uh, plethodontid salamanders. Now we'll move on to another aquatic group, the, the mud puppies and water dogs. We have three species in Alabama, um, one of which is only found in Alabama, the Alabama water dog, sometimes called the black river water dog. There's a, one species called the Gulf Coast water dog and then the mud puppy, which uh, occurs outside of Alabama. These are very aquatic. They almost look like larval salamanders, but uh, I'll point out here, and they, they look very similar. They do have both forelimbs and high limbs and retain gills as adults. So this is an adult uh, water dog uh, with external gills. So it, it doesn't breathe air with its lungs. It uses its, its uh, gills, which it retains as adults. So this, these breed in water. They're in egg water, larvae in water, and as adults. They never leave the water, uh, which is true for all the um, nectarids or water dogs. And, they, and uh, so kind of interesting. So we have several um, aquatic groups that are not closely related in Alabama. So if you find an aquatic salamander, it could be a larval salamander for a terrestrial species, or it could actually be, in some cases, a species which never leaves water its entire life. Um, another group we have, uh, not a lot of diversity, are newts. And these are kind of interesting because um, they've got a lot of things going on with them that are interesting biologically. One species, the eastern newt. Uh, here's what the adults typically look like. So as adults, they're aquatic. Um, some of them having red spots like this. You, they're very common in isolated pools, um, often floating at the surface. Um, so these ones as adults are aquatic, but they go through a stage. So they start as eggs in water. They have a larval form that's aquatic. But before they get back to being aquatic and adult, they leave the water. And they have this really weird stage called a red eft. So you, you may have seen these. Um, these ones you'll see in broad daylight. These have a lot of toxins in them. It's actually a neurotoxin. Um, and a lot of predators know you can't handle these or consume these. So I just find it remarkable. You find these things, and then they go back to the water. So what's really neat about these salamanders, they start in the water, they leave the water, and then they return to the water as adults to complete their life cycle. So it's kind of unique among amphibians. Um, and we have a species here in Alabama that does this kind of really interesting uh, biological lifestyle. Another aquatic group I want to touch on are the sirens. I think it's a great name. Uh, sirens I uh, kind of come from mythology, these um, mermaid-like creatures that lured uh, ships to crash on, 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 on rocks. Um, when you see the salamanders, they don't quite look like the, the, the sirens you may have seen illustrated in history, but we've got three species here, but they're, again, really special group of aquatic salamanders look a lot like the amphiumas but they're completely unrelated uh, but have a similar kind of body form we have three species here a lesser siren a greater siren and just two years ago the third species was described the reticulated siren and this is a large two foot long aquatic salamander which just brings home the point that some of these new species are not tiny little things uh, some of these are quite large animals and this is one of the kind of the largest vertebrate animals that's been described in north america in the past hundred years. And here's a picture of what they look like. This is the reticulated siren. And again, it looks a little bit like a mud puppy, maybe a little bit like the amphiuma. It does have external gills like um, water dogs do, um, the mud puppies. And it does have forelimbs, and they're kind of hard to see here. Right behind the gill, you can actually see its left forelimb. And there's one on the other side, but it has no hind limb. So unlike the amphiuma, this one only has four limbs. So mud puppies have external gills, four limbs, hind limbs. Amphiuma have no external gills, and they do have four limbs and hind limbs. And then sirens have external gills and only have four limbs. So three different uh, groups of aquatic salamanders, um, three different families. And while they might look similar on superficial, um, you can kind of tell them apart relatively easy if you just know what to look for. So I think, Rebecca, with that, that's the last uh, slide I have for the species I'm going to talk about today. I haven't touched on all of them, uh, but I'd really like to take some questions from um, our viewers about amphibians uh, in Alabama, and uh, I'll, I'll end with that. Yeah, if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Friel, uh, feel free to drop them in the comment section. We did have a question about salamanders. Do they live in groups? Do you know? Uh, most salamanders tend to be kind of solitary. Um, you don't tend to find them. The only time you see them in groups are during breeding season. Um, so, for example, a lot of the ambistomads, maddots, I've been to ponds where there have been hundreds of individuals. Sometimes some of these species, the males come up first. Um, they'll kind of stake territories waiting for the females to come in. Um, the other really weird thing about uh, salamanders, I'm thinking about it, is the way they reproduce. Um, 
the females lay a little packet of sperm called a spermatophore that the that they pick up with their what's called their cloaca. Uh, frogs and salamanders only have one hole for their reproductive system for their waste products called the cloaca, and mm -hmm. they have to pick up these little packets of sperm that, that that leave them. In frogs, it's external fertilization. The frogs actually and play. You actually see the one I didn't mention. I don't think I showed any pictures. Sometimes you'll see both frogs and salamanders together. It's awfully uh, a male holding a female. It's called amplexus, um, and you'll often see that uh, when they're breeding. Uh, but outside of that, a lot of frogs and salamanders tend to be solitary. Uh, some of them do offer, or some salamanders do offer paternal care. You will sometimes see an adult salamander with its eggs. It's not uncommon to find the adult wrapped around um, its eggs. So um, salamanders do provide, some salamanders at least, do provide some parental care. Frogs don't. Frogs typically just, the eggs get fertilized and left to develop on their own. That is very interesting. Well, I have selfishly, I have a question because since we were talking about frogs, um, I thought I would ask you because I saw a news story uh, not too long ago about a, a certain kind of frog that looked like one of my favorite frogs, uh, Kermit the Frog. So I was wondering if you knew anything about this uh this uh it's I, I guess it's a new discovery uh, of frogs in costa rica it's uh this they're, they're frogs like i said their frogs are incredibly diverse globally um there's new species described all the time sometimes with neat new features they're actually venomous frogs now that can actually bite and have some kind of venom um the other thing is that frogs are under threat i, I should put a little plug in here um uh, a lot of amphibians um, have gone extinct uh, around the world. Uh, they're threatened by climate change and also by disease. Um, there are this type of fungus that affects a lot of uh, frog species and now salamander species around the world. And we actually have researchers here at the University of Alabama that are studying that, um, chytrid fungus. And so I'll, I'll put a little plug in for people like that here. So we have research where people are uh, studying kind of amphibian conservation uh, and uh, diseases that affect them. So it's kind of really interesting. Uh, we think a lot about diseases now that we're under a viral uh, pandemic, but there are similar pandemics that are affecting amphibians around the world. And uh, there are people that are going out to observe frogs. That's why you know I encourage people to document their frogs because um, we can help document, particularly, you know, no one likes finding a dead frog, but potentially an observation like that could help researchers um, study how populations throughout the state are, might be affected by known diseases as well as new diseases which are emerging. But I, yeah, I not disagree with the, get back to your question, uh, the one in Costa Rica, the, I'm assuming it was a green frog described from Costa Rica, um, but I don't know the specific details on it. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's, I don't know if it's a glass frog. Does that oh, seem be. Yeah, there are glass frogs there that, um, glass frogs are really cool. They look a lot like our tree frogs, but they're kind of translucent. Uh, particularly their ventral surface. So if you ever, if you Google glass frog, you'll sometimes see pictures where it'll, it'll be up against a piece of glass and looking at its belly, you can see its organs. You can see its heart beating. You can see blood flowing through its veins. So yeah, they're really cool. They're kind of almost glass-like uh, and hence their name. That is wild. Well, it yeah, be, I know. Maybe the one, I, it could actually be named for Kermit. Uh, a lot of scientists sometimes for their scientific names will name things after. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a frog named for Kermit, like something Kermit uh <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up because uh, I saw that news story the other day and I was like, oh, well, that makes total sense. Uh, I need to do more research. Oh, into that it. was a good pun there, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really trying not to, I, I promise. Uh, let's see. I think we have a couple of other questions. Um, uh, blind worms. Do you know anything about blind worms? Well, are, are there... probably, I've heard that term for there are uh, snakes. There are actually, there are Trop we actually have them in Alabama because they get moved around. There are some um, snakes which are basically live in plant potted plants. I think they sometimes call them blind or, or uh, blind worms. Or so I think that's what they might be referring to. I've heard that as a common name um, that they they get trans they're parthenogenic, which means they 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 can reproduce a single individual doesn't require males and females, and they're global in the world because they get moved around in potted plants. They're just they call them um, thread snakes. And they look like little worms, uh, but they are actually a vertebrate, um, a snake, in fact, that, um, you know, is introduced. So they're, th I think that may be what they're referring to. Okay. Uh, let's see. And we also had a question from Melissa. Uh, is a newt considered a type of salamander? Is there a difference? Yes. Yes. Like I said, newts, um, typically everything in the family salamandry are called newts. 
Um, and then we had the one species here. Um, so, and, and, and most, some newts look a little bit, when you get, I can find pictures where some newts look like some of our mole salamanders. It's really hard. I mean, they're kind of is the ideal. It feels like toads. There are frog, you know, toads are technically frogs, uh, but there are a lot of frogs that converge on being, and toad is more, it's a kind of like tortoise and turtle. Um, you know, this is the all tortoises or turtles. It, it often reflects some kind of specialization, but they're always exceptions. Um, but newts in general refer to uh, one family of salamanders, the salamandridae. And, and they're, while they're not particularly diverse here, um, there are other parts in the world where there are multiple species of newts. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for our questions. Yeah, it looks like that's all for our questions uh, for today. Uh, so thank you, John, for taking us through that and, yeah. and answering some of those questions. And yeah, I really enjoyed uh, it. People have questions. They can reach out to me. Um, I'm, I'm, my email address is probably available. On, I know it's available on our, our website. Um, I'm more than happy. I really encourage people to try out with iNaturals. Go out. Um, I still, when I go out now at night, I'm always listening for frogs. So I encourage you to challenge. Next time you're walking around any body of water, um, there are a lot of insects calling that too. So they're not just frogs that you'll hear at night, but uh, you might be surprised how many different frog species you might be able to hear um, if you take a stroll somewhere in your neighborhood. Uh, yeah, I've, I've found them in my neighborhood, so I'll have to keep looking out for them. Um, well, if you're interested in any of our uh, Museums from Your Home live streams, uh, you can check out museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. That'll give you a full live stream schedule and where to watch them and also an archived list of the live streams that we've already done, as well as some educational resources from the Alabama Museum of Natural History and Moundville, Ar Moundville Archaeological Park and Discovering Alabama. So if you need any educational resources for the summer, uh, that's a good place to go. Uh, we're going to be doing Museums from Your Home live streams um, uh, Monday through Friday for this week. Uh, we're uh, Tomorrow we're going to be back at the Alabama Museum of Natural History, uh, sort of wrapping up a an archaeology and paleontology series we've been doing there for Family Fridays. Um, and so you can check that out there. If you're interested in supporting U UA Museums, you can go to give.ua.edu slash museums. It's a great way to support what we're doing and uh, what we do in the future. So uh, if you uh, are interested in that, please consider uh, giving to give.ua slash museums. If you want to keep up with all of our live streams and our video content and some of the isolation observations like Dr. Friel mentioned, you can go to youtube.com slash UA museums and subscribe there. It's a great way to uh, be notified and keep uh, in touch with everything that we're doing. Uh, so I think that's going to do it for us today. Thank you to everybody who watched and uh, asked us questions. And thank you to everybody who is going to watch and for visiting UA museums from your home. Well, uh, have a great day, Dr. Friel. Yep. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, everybody.